Pacifica, this is Democracy Now! Esperamos comprensión. We hope for understanding. We hope for a bit of heart. So U.S. authorities can understand that we come to seek asylum from our countries. We can't return. In my case, I can't return to my country because I'm in danger of losing my life. Not just mine, but those of my family as well. A standoff continues on the U.S.-Mexican border where scores of asylum seekers are attempting to cross into the United States after taking part in a month-long caravan. Many of the participants are migrants fleeing violence in Honduras, Guatemala and El Salvador. We'll go to the border to get the latest. Then the acclaimed Indian writer, Arundhati Roy. Is there a connection between the rise of the Hindu right, what is happening in Kashmir, how women are treated, what's happening, I mean, that we are a, system, we are a society that practices caste, which is the most institutionalized form of hierarchy, and yet few people write about it. It's like writing about apartheid. South Africa, with the, omitting to mention there was apartheid. We'll speak with Arundhati Roy about Kashmir, the rise of the right in India, her return to fiction, and her latest book, The Ministry of Utmost Happiness. We'll also speak with her about her visit with Edward Snowden in Moscow. All that and more coming up. Welcome to Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. Former New York City Mayor Rudy Giuliani said Wednesday President Trump reimbursed Trump's lawyer and fixer Michael Cohen for a $130,000 hush money payment to Cohen made on the eve of the 2000 election to adult film star Stephanie Clifford, also known as Stormy Daniels. Giuliani made the comments Wednesday evening in an interview with Fox News host Sean Hannity. That money was not campaign money. Sorry, I'm giving you a fact now that you don't know. It's not campaign money, no campaign finance violation. So, so they, they funneled it through the law firm. Funneled through the law firm, and the president repaid it. Oh, I didn't know he did. Yeah. And the president repaid it, Giuliani said. The former mayor recently joined President Trump's legal team and is negotiating with special counsel Robert Mueller over a possible interview with Trump. His Fox News comments directly contradict Trump's claim last month he did not know that Cohen had paid Stormy Daniels or where Cohen had gotten the money for the payment. White House press secretary Sarah Huckabee Sanders reiterated Trump's denial in March. The president has addressed these directly and um, made very well clear that uh, none of these allegations are true. Uh, this case has already been, been won in arbitration, and anything beyond that, I would refer you to the president's out outside counsel. When did the president address specifically the cash payment that was made in October of 2016? The president has denied the allegations against him. Uh, and again, this case has already been won in arbitration. Anything beyond that, I would refer you to outside counsel. This morning, President Trump tweeted a denial that he'd had a sexual encounter with Daniels in 2006, accusing her of extortion and of violating a nondisclosure agreement. Trump also said he'd paid Michael Cohen a retainer for legal services, adding, quote, money from the campaign or campaign contributions played no role in this transaction, unquote. Legal analysts say Cohen's payment likely amounted to a campaign finance violation, even if Trump repaid it, since it constituted a loan to Trump's campaign that went unreported in federal election filings. This comes as President Trump hired Washington, D.C. attorney Emmett Flood to replace White House lawyer Ty Cobb as part of his legal team working to contain fallout from special counsel Robert Mueller's Russia investigation. Flood previously represented President Bill Clinton during his his impeachment in 1998. The Pentagon Wednesday transferred longtime Guantanamo prisoner Ahmed Mohammed al Darbi to Saudi Arabia in the first such move under the Trump administration. Al Darbi is the only prisoner who's pleaded guilty in the military commissions at the U.S. naval base in Guantanamo. In a statement, the Center for Constitutional Rights, which represents many of Guantanamo's prisoners, said it was relieved over al Darbi's transfer, but added, quote, his transfer came at great cost. Over 12 years in Guantanamo, and he is not yet free. And much as we would like to hope it signals further positive movement from his admin this administration, there is no such indication. 
40 Muslim men remain imprisoned in an entrenched prison system that was set up to evade just laws and experiment on human beings, and that system continues, CCR wrote. As a presidential candidate, Donald Trump promised to expand the prison at Guantanamo and said he would, quote, load it up with some bad dudes. Wednesday's release of Al Darby came as the Pentagon said it's formally set to receive new prisoners at Guantanamo for an indefinite stay. In Libya, a pair of suicide bombers stormed the offices of Libya's Electoral Commission in Tripoli Wednesday, opening fire on workers before blowing themselves up. At least 12 people died in the assault, with seven others wounded. ISIS later claimed responsibility. The attack came as the Electoral Commission is working to register new voters ahead of a national election to be held by the end of the year. This is Ahmad al Saya, chair of the commission. This breach targeted democracy and the future of the Libyan people. And in reality, it did not target the commission in itself. What it targeted today was the future of the Libyan people and the power of choice. The United States has returned thousands of ancient artifacts looted from Iraq and illegally acquired by the U.S.-based Christian craft chain store Hobby Lobby. Wednesday's handover of 3,800 artifacts, including Bibles, to Iraq's ambassador in Washington came nearly a year after Hobby Lobby agreed to pay a $3 million fine after it spent over a million and a half dollars in 2010 to purchase the smuggled artifacts from a dealer based in the United Arab Emirates. The sales violated a ban on the sale of cult Iraqi cultural artifacts in place since 2004. Hobby Lobby's owners are conservative Christians who recently opened a museum of the Bible in Washington, D.C. In 2014, Hobby Lobby won a landmark decision at the Supreme Court, which ruled private companies that claim religious objections can refuse to provide birth control coverage to their employees. At the Vatican, three Chileans who were abused by Catholic priests as children have urged Pope Francis to take action to end an epidemic of sexual abuse and cover-up within the Church. Their joint statement came after five days of meetings with Pope Francis and just weeks after the pontiff reversed course and apologized publicly over his role in failing to halt abuses. This is Juan Carlos Cruz, one of the three Chilean whistleblowers. We were able to speak frankly and respectfully to the Pope. We talked about difficult issues such as sexual abuse, abuse of power, and especially the cover-up of the Chilean bishops. Realities that we do not refer to as sins, but as crimes and corruption that do not end in Chile, but are an epidemic. An epidemic that has destroyed thousands of lives, people who trusted and who were betrayed in their faith and their trust. In Savannah, Georgia, a Puerto Rico Air National Guard military plane crashed shortly after takeoff Wednesday, killing nine people aboard. The crash came as the plane was bound for a base in Arizona, where it was set to be de decommissioned. The C-130 was one of the oldest such aircraft, still flying at more than 60 years old. Meanwhile, in Puerto Rico, hundreds of protesters marched to the streets of San Juan Wednesday, following up on massive May Day protests against austerity measures. The protesters are also demanding the repeal of the PROMESA Act, which created an unelected, federally appointed control board with sweeping powers to run Puerto Rico's economy. This is Jorge Diaz, one of the protesters. My name is Jorge Diaz. I'm the artistic director of Agitarte, a cultural solidarity organization based on Santurce, right here, Santurce, Puerto Rico. And we're here today on the 2nd of May to continue the celebration and resistance of May Day. On May Day, when we were yesterday in Atorre, and we got attacked by the police and the state for marching, for defending our rights. So we're here today again to let them know that no matter if we get arrested, no matter if we get banged on, gassed, pepper spray, we're going to be here. We're going to defend because this is about our rights and about our people and about our communities. Iowa's Republican-led legislature voted Wednesday to approve the nation's most restrictive ban on abortions. Republican Governor Kim Reynolds has promised to sign the bill, which outlaws abortions once a fetal heartbeat can be detected, something that typically happens just six weeks into a pregnancy and before many women even realize they're pregnant. 
Opponents call the bill unconstitutional and warn it opens the door for doctors who perform abortions to be criminally prosecuted. This is Iowa State Representative Brian Meyer, a Democrat. I know what the law is, because I do it every day. I'm asking you if you understand the bill that you're passing today creates essentially a murder charge for a doctor. Iowa's anti-choice bill came as Planned Parenthood and other abortion rights groups filed suit against President Trump and Vice President Pence, challenging its the ro rollback of a federal program that provides birth control and other reproductive health care services to millions of low-income women. The Washington Post is reporting former CBS and PBS TV host Charlie Rose was involved in far more workplace sexual misconduct than previously reported. The Post reports an additional 27 women have accused Rose of sexual harassment over 30 years, and that CBS managers were repeatedly warned over the allegations but failed to intervene. Rose was fired from CBS and PBS last year amidst accusations of groping women, making lewd phone calls walking around naked or in an open bathrobe, and more. The voter profiling company Cambridge Analytica is closing and will begin insolvency proceedings. Cambridge Analytica gained international attention after Facebook revealed it acquired the personal information of up to 87 million people without their permission as part of an effort to sway voters to support President Donald Trump. In Philadelphia, a pair of black men who were arrested at a Starbucks store after an employee called police claiming they were trespassing have settled the lawsuit with the coffee chain and the city. Rayshawn Nelson and Dante Robinson will receive a symbolic settlement of $1 each from Philadelphia, along with a promise from Starbucks to set up a $200,000 program for young entrepreneurs. The arrest on April 12 sparked national debate over racial profiling and set off a wave of civil disobedience protests in Philadelphia. Starbucks has promised to close 8,000 of its U.S. stores on the afternoon of May 29 for racial bias training. The settlement that the men made with Starbucks has not been disclosed. In Massachusetts, Harvard President Drew Faust said Tuesday the university will recognize a newly formed union of graduate students and undergraduate teaching assistants and will begin negotiations for a union contract. Faust's announcement came a week after thousands of students voted in favor of forming the Harvard Graduate Students Union, a chapter of the United Automobile Workers, or the UAW. And in Arizona, public school teachers remain on strike today as budget negotiations that would include more funding for public education stalled on Wednesday. Republican Governor Doug Ducey has promised to sign a budget deal that would end the strike, including a 20 percent pay raise for teachers and school staff, but lawmakers are still debating the budget. The strike began Thursday, with teachers protesting the $1 billion funding cuts to education in the state since the 2008 recession. Go to democracynow.org for an extended discussion about the Arizona strike. And those are some of the headlines. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. And I'm Nermeen Sheikh. Welcome to our listeners and viewers around the country and around the world. A standoff continues on the U.S.-Mexico border, where scores of asylum seekers are attempting to cross into the United States after taking part in a month-long caravan that began more than 2,000 miles away in the southern Mexican state of Chiapas. Many of the caravan participants are migrants fleeing violence in Honduras, Guatemala and El Salvador. The caravan is organized annually by the group Pueblo Sin Fronteras, or People Without Borders. It made international headlines this year, largely thanks to President Trump. In one tweet, Trump wrote, quote, getting more dangerous, caravans coming. During a rally in Michigan on Saturday, Trump again criticized the caravan. We believe that a strong nation must have strong borders. Are you watching that mess that's going on right now with the caravan coming up? Are you watching this? And our laws are so weak. 
They're so pathetic, given to us by Democrats. Under international law, the United States must allow foreigners seeking asylum to enter the country. But supporters of the caravan say border authorities have been slow to take in members of the caravan seeking asylum. Around 100 asylum seekers have been accepted for processing, but scores remain camped out by the border near San Diego, California. This is caravan member Nefi Hernandez from Honduras. We hope for understanding. We hope for a bit of heart, so U.S. authorities can understand that we come to seek asylum from our countries. We can't return. In my case, I can't return to my country because I'm in danger of losing my life. Not just mine, but those of my family as well. On Wednesday, Attorney General Jeff Sessions announced he would send an additional 35 assistant U.S. attorneys and 18 immigration judges to the U.S.-Mexico border. We are not going to let this country be overwhelmed. People are not going to caravan or otherwise stampede our border. We need legality and integrity in the system. People should uh, wait their turn, uh, ask uh, to apply lawfully before they enter our country. So we're sending a message worldwide. Don't come illegally. Make your claim to enter America in the lawful way and wait your turn. For more, we're joined by two guests. In Atlanta, Tristan Call is a volunteer with Pueblos Sin Fronteras, which is People Without Borders, just back from spending time with the caravan in Mexico. And joining us on the phone from the border, from Tijuana, Mexico, Nicole Ramos is director of the Border Rights Project um, of Al Otro Lado, a project that works with asylum seekers who want to present themselves to U.S. authorities. We welcome you both to Democracy Now! And we want to begin with Nicole. Tell us us the latest. You have President Trump constantly railing against this caravan, demanding that Mexico break it up before it got to the border, as he's demanded they pay for the border wall. Um, the caravan has arrived at the border, maybe fewer people than uh, was originally intended. And you've got, what, more than 25 people who have already processed? Uh, explain the situation. Well, the caravan members that are camped out at the border are trying to access a legal process which has existed for decades. Uh, it's very clear that President Trump and Attorney General Sessions do not understand this section of federal law under Title VIII, Section 1225 of the United States Code. This is not illegal migration. This is the legal process, which allows an asylum seeker to prevent, prevent themselves at a port of entry to an immigration officer, indicate that they have a fear of return, after which time they are to be granted an interview with an asylum officer. So. Their commentary that this is a stampede, this is illegal migration, this is not waiting their turn, this is the process. And what explanation, Nicole, have you received for why uh, there have been such delays in the processing of these uh, uh, asylees or people seeking asylum not having been granted it? U.S. Customs and Border Protection has indicated that they lack the capacity at the port of entry to process these asylum seekers. However, they were aware that this caravan was traveling for now almost a month, and the numbers have significantly diminished. 200 presenting themselves, and what we have is either a failure to prepare or a refusal to prepare, and I would argue it is the latter, given that Customs and Border Protection is the largest law enforcement agency in the United States. And what do you make of Jeff Sessions saying he's sending more lawyers and judges to the border right now and talking about people can't overrun the border? People are not trying to overrun the border. It's a very small group when you consider all the people that migrate in a year. And the fact that he's sending more attorneys and more judges to adjudicate the cases, that's assuming that you know people first get past the, the first step, which is an interview with an asylum officer. So his allocation of resources, his calculus, is, is two steps ahead, which again indicates to me that, unfortunately, Attorney General Sessions does not understand immigration law very well. And Nicole, you're in Tijuana, uh, uh, Mexico. Could you describe what the scene is there uh, at the border? Uh, it's it's a desperate situation. Uh, it's it's hopeful in the sense that people, you know, they know that they are not 
going to be camped out forever. They don't know how long they will be waiting. But it is a desperate situation to come so far and coming to the U.S. because we are a nation of laws, because we do put ourselves out on the world stage as a nation that fights for human rights and respects human rights, and to get to the border and have the port of entry door literally closed in their faces. And I've been down to the gate to the U.S., and it is all but, almost all but blocked off except for one tiny door. And so that in itself is, is very heartbreaking, but it's a testament to the desperation that the people feel and the fear that is driving them to flee their countries is that they're willing to go to a place that they know may be hostile to them because it is the only option. Let's turn to Fox News host Tucker Carlson on the arrival of the caravan at the U.S.-Mexico border, um, where he attacked you, Nicole Ramos, by name. The left argues we have no moral right to stop any of them from doing that. Here's attorney Nicole Ramos of Tijuana denouncing the U.S. government as criminal for trying to enforce our own federal law. Watch. The message for customs and border protection. Stop rejecting asylum seekers who try to present themselves at the port of entry. You know what you're doing. You know you turn people away. You complain that they are breaking the law by entering illegally. You are breaking the law, and you are forcing them to break the law. That's why we have caravans. Yeah, that's definitely someone you want in control of our public policy, screaming into a bullhorn. Your response, Nicole Ramos, live on the border to Tucker Carlson of Fox News. Well, I'm, I'm using a bullhorn because I'm at a press conference and it's a pretty chaotic scene uh, so that the crowd could hear me. I don't normally walk around with a bullhorn. Uh, Customs and Border Protection has a history dating back years of rejecting asylum seekers who try to present themselves and follow the legal process. I have been collecting data on illegal turnbacks in Tijuana at the port of entry since December of 2015. I have accompanied hundreds of asylum seekers, and of those hundreds that I've accompanied, there are countless times that a CBP officer has told the client that I'm with that they cannot seek asylum at the port of entry, that they have to go to the embassy in their home country or the consulate, uh, which just, it, it's not true. That the law is that it allows someone to go to a port of entry, and it forces people who don't have the support of advocates to try to enter through irregular means. These are people who are trying to follow the law, and you have federal law enforcement officers who are breaking the law and who are so brazen in their disregard for the law that they will do it in front of an attorney, an officer of the court. And this history is well documented in the human rights reports of Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, Human Rights First, and it's the subject of litigation that our organization has filed against DHS. Well, I want to turn to some of the people uh, who have been seeking uh, asylum. Uh, Channel, a 28-year-old Honduran trans woman, for instance, uh, said she had no option but to leave her country because of the discrimination she faced at home due to her sexual orientation. I don't think I'll ever return to my country, because I don't think I'd survive to tell my story. I have already survived an attack, and it's very difficult. I've already been between life and death. I was in a coma for three days, and I wouldn't want that for me. In the United States, I see myself sleeping calmly. I see myself sleeping better, not only myself, but my friends, where we are able to obtain more respect, where there is no bullying against us, where people don't shout at us, where the decision of each person is truly respected such as the decision of being trans women. Uh, so, Tristan Cole, uh, you're a volunteer with uh, People Without Borders. You've just returned from spending time with the caravan in Mexico. Uh, could you talk about the, the conditions that people seeking asylum uh, are fleeing? Yeah. Um, I think the, one of the most important things to understand in why people traveled in a caravan together is not just the, that there are people who have been displaced by tremendous trauma and violence in the countries that they're coming from, um, but also traveling through Mexico is an incredibly dangerous thing that's become more and more dangerous because of the, the forms of criminalization that are getting replicated from the U.S. model in Mexico. And so the, the amounts of violence, of kidnapping, of assaults uh, by, U by Mexican officials within Mexico against migrants who are en route 
is one of the one of the main reasons why they've decided to band together for their own security. Um, coming from Honduras especially, I think it's important to understand that there's a regional crisis that's going on in Central America where larger and larger numbers of people are being expelled through violence and, and discrimination, um, in Honduras especially through political violence after the continuation in power of Juan uh, Orlando Hernández, who most people in Honduras uh, understand uh, is staying in power through an electoral fraud. Nicole Ramos, what happens next on the border? Apart from ensuring that the caravan members are able to present themselves in accordance with U.S. law, what happens next uh, is unclear because for the last several weeks, months, we've had asylum seekers camped out in front of the port of entry. So what's happening to the caravan is a continuation of an existing phenomenon where Customs and Border Protection will artificially set a limit for how many people it will accept a day. Uh, it won't process asylum seekers at night. It's indicated to Mexican authorities that they don't process people on the weekends. Uh, and so what they're doing is, is they're, they're setting these artificial parameters that don't exist anywhere in our federal regulations. Uh, and one of the strengths of the caravan is that it's allowing asylum seekers to come out of the shadow in Mexico. Uh, not only are we dealing with the caravan members on the ground, but now we have other asylum seekers who are coming to the camp because they know attorneys are there, and they're asking questions, and they're talking about their own experiences of being turned away after trying to present themselves multiple times. And so we're going to be continuing to collect that data. We're going to continue to ask advocate for those individuals after the caravan leaves, uh, and we're going to continue doing this work. We may not have a camp, but we are going to sit outside of the port of entry until they process every single one of them. Well, we want to thank you both for being with us. Nicole Ramos of the Border Rights Project of Al Otro Lado, which means the other side, and Tristan Call with the group People Without Borders. This is Democracy Now! When we come back, the acclaimed writer activist Arundhati Roy. Stay with us. Field by Calexico. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Nermeen Shea. We spend the rest of the hour with the legendary award-winning author Aruntati Roy. She won the Booker Prize in 1997 for her novel The God of Small Things. In 2017, 20 years after the publication of her first novel, she published another work of fiction, which is just out in paperback, titled The Ministry of Utmost Happiness. This is a clip from a short film introducing the novel, narrated by Aruntati Roy and directed by Sanjay Kak and Tarun Bhartia. She lived in the graveyard like a tree. At dawn, she saw the crows off and welcomed the bats home. At dusk, she did the opposite. When people called her names, clown without a circus, queen without a palace, she let the hurt blow through her branches like a breeze and used the music of her rustling leaves as balm to ease the pain. Who says my name is Anjum? I'm not Anjum, I'm Anjuman, 
I'm a mehfil. I'm a gathering of everybody and nobody, of everything and nothing. Is there anyone else you'd like to invite? Everyone's invited. Dear comrade Azad Bharatiya Garu, my comrade Suguna knows to send this letter to you when she hears that I am no more. As you know, we are banned underground people, and this letter from me you can call as underground of underground. How to tell a shattered story by slowly becoming everybody. No, by slowly becoming everything. That's a short film introducing Arundhati Roy's most recent book. The film is directed by Sanjay Kak and Tarun Bhartia. The Ministry of Utmost Happiness was long listed for the Booker Prize and nominated for the National Book Critics Circle Award. The Washington Post praised the book, writing, quote, This is a remarkable creation, a story both intimate and international, swelling with comedy and outrage, a tale that cradles the world's most fragile people, even while it assaults the subcontinent's most brutal villains. It will leave you awed by the heat of its anger and the depth of its compassion. Indian literary critic Nalanjana Roy hailed the novel as, quote, an elegy for a bulldozed world. Arundhati Roy received the 2002 Lannan Foundation Cultural Freedom Prize, and her journalism and essays have been collected in several books, including The End of Imagination, Field Notes on Democracy, Listening to Grasshoppers, and Capitalism, A Ghost Story. Arundhati Roy, welcome back to the United States and Thank to Democracy you. Now. Thank you, Amy. It's a great honor to be with you. So your book has just come out in paperback, and we want to talk, we want to talk about also the response to it over this year. But why don't you start off by talking about why you chose to go back to writing a novel and the title, The Ministry of Utmost Happiness? Uh, well, you know, when I finished, uh, when I wrote The God of Small Things, I, I never ever saw myself as a person who, you know, because I'd written a successful book, I had to just keep doing the same thing. And I, I always said that I'd only write a book when I had a book to write. And for 20 years, I spent sort of traveling through India um, in, in, you know, in the valleys and the forests where the in Kashmir, in, in the forest of Bastar, trying to understand the, the very massive and sudden changes that were happening, you know, particularly post uh, what they call globalization, you know. And, the, and, and, and it was obvious that, that this new economy was traveling parallel with a, a, a huge impetus of Hindu nationalism, and the both were com traveling companions. And now, of course, you you know it's at its <clears throat> at its peak. The the battles are both so joined at the hip. And I, uh, if I could just interrupt briefly, <clears throat> Arun yeah. if you could just explain the context uh, uh, in which liberalization or globalization <clears throat> came in to India, what accounted for the transformation uh, of the economy after really decades uh, uh, of a different kind of economic system? Well, obviously, until uh, you know, 1990, India was what. I mean, India called itself a non-aligned state. It had a, a protected economy, an economy that was doing badly, by the way, you know, for reasons that we all know of massive corruption, of this very, very centralized forms of development. But after, basically, after the end of the war in Afghanistan, you know, I mean, the war hasn't ended in Afghanistan, but after the collapse of the Soviet Union in Afghanistan, it became India became completely aligned. Now it thinks of itself as an ally of Israel and the U.S. and the markets. And and when the world became unipolar, now now it's collapsing that. But then the markets were opened, and liberalisation entered 
uh, at a speed which was hard to imagine, you know. Every form of protection to workers was dismantled, rivers, forests, everything was privatized. Now education, health, all of it is, is in a state of uh, collapse, you know, in a way the polarization that we all know globalization brings is happening and you have, it was almost as though you had a feudal country which, a feudal and colonized country, which in 1947, from 1947 to 1990 tried, even if symbolically, you know, to, uh, I mean, the radical movements in the 60s, for example, were talking about the redistribution of wealth, the redistribution of land, of justice, of revolution. But suddenly, um, this new economy has pushed even the radical discourse into a space where people are just asking to let, let's say, indigenous people continue to live on what little land they have instead of it being taken over by the corporation. The idea of redistribution is, is over. And, ye and yet you have a situation where, in a way, it's a form of corporate feudalism because the land which belonged to the upper castes now belong to the corporates which are upper caste, you know. So caste, feudalism, capitalism, all of it merges in a, in a very unique way in, in, that, in that place, you know. And you had, for example, you had 50 years of some gesture towards what we call reservation, what you call affirmative action. Now, uh, you have privatization in which Dalits are being pushed out all over again, pushed out of educational institutions, pushed out of jobs, pushed out of... So, so you have the consolidation of upper caste, upper class capitalism. You have a situation where, uh, uh, like everywhere else, you know, 100 families own 25 percent or something of the GDP. And you have a consolidation of inequality, which is incredible. But how do you manage that in a place like that? You manage it by by uh, with the flag of Hindu nationalism, by making people who are actually losing feel that they are winning the Hindu nation. And you isolate the Muslim community. Last, uh, last election proved that you don't need the Muslim vote. So the Muslims of India who number maybe 150 to 200 million people are actually now surplus people they are not re their vote is not required their, the their, their, their the 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 work through which they have sustained themselves you know the meat industry the cattle industry the leather industry all under attack shut down so they've been pushed to the bottom they are being ghettoized lynched uh, so so you, you know hindu nationalism is the management policy to to uh, to quell the unrest that liberalization has brought. Well, let me just go back because the initial question that that Amy asked had been about, and I'd interrupted you <coughs> uh, about what brought you back to fiction. So, in a way, when you wrote *The God of Small Things*, which came out in 1997, yeah. is that right? Uh, the the at that moment, it, that's when these massive transformations as a result of liberalization were coming in and accelerating uh, in India. So, uh, could you explain the time that you spent in these 20 years, uh, the kind of writing you did then, and why? I mean, you've been working on this book, The Ministry, for, for the last 10 years. So what brought you back uh, uh, to fiction? Well, uh, you know, after I wrote uh, The God of Small Things and when it won the book, uh, I've spoken about this many times, you know, I was suddenly sort of being uh, marketed as the face of this new liberal, new liberal India, which was, a, which was something I was very uncomfortable with. And then in uh, 1998, uh, the, the BJP government, the NDA, the National Demo Democratic Alliance, the BJP being the main party, came in and did the, a series of nuclear tests. And for me, somehow, the national, those tests, you know, changed the national discourse in terms of what is acceptable to be said openly 
you know, it isn't that the, I mean, the RSS, which is the party, the, the organization which Modi belongs to, the Rashtriya Swayam Sevak Sangh, which has always believed that India should be declared a Hindu nation, was actually formed in 1925. So we are watching something that has been inexorably growing to this place. So it's not that the nuclear tests started something new, but they jump-started a discourse. Uh, they allowed things to be said in public that were not acceptable earlier. They gave that a kind of acceptance. And then I wrote uh, this essay called The End of Imagination, and so suddenly the, the fairy princess was kicked off her pedestal. But that led me into 20 years of following what was going on, you know, the, anti the protests against dams, the, you know, for, for example, I wrote a big essay called The Greater Common Good about the protest against the Narmada. And, and to me, the, the, the Narmada dam, the Narmada right. dam, sorry, the dams that are built on this Narmada river. And to me, that political understanding and education that I received from that movement, I see the bones of, the sacrificial bones of this uniquely Indian fascism really in the foundations of that dam. You know, really the idea that there is a community that is more entitled than another, the idea that you can take the water from a river valley, centralize it in a dam reservoir, and then decide who should, who should get that water. I mean, recently, now that the dam is built, now that everything that the anti-dam movement has said has come true, we had an incredible spectacle of whatever little water there was in the reservoir, which should have been used for the farmers of Gujarat through the drought months, given what the dam said it was going to do, was released in a rush the day just weeks before the Gujarat election, for what? For the prime minister to land a seaplane as an election spectacle. And today, that water is gone, and what little water there is in the canal is being protected by the police from farmers who need it. You know, this is fascism. It's not just concentration camps, you know? So I... I uh, I mean, 20 years of, of traveling, of seeing, of writing, but all those essays were always very urgent interventions in a situation that was closing down. There was some, something very urgent about the way they were written. But simultaneously, there was all this kind of gathering in me. For example, the travels in Kashmir. I could not write about Kashmir. Nobody really can easily write about Kashmir in non-fiction, because what happens there is not just based on what evidence you can pr produce, you know, the, the terror that seeds the air, the terror of living in the most dense military occupation in the world, half a million soldiers, the, the complicated... Which most people here really know almost nothing, nothing about. Nothing about. I mean, just imagine the fact that just in the last few two or three years, a new technique of firing pellet guns into crowds has blinded completely or partially more than a thousand people. A thousand people, you know? but. Under the banner of this market-friendly democracy, no one's going to talk about it. Under the banner of a democracy that buys huge amounts of weapons from France, from America, we are being courted. Our, uh, uh, all those dark secrets mm. are, are being swept under the carpet because we are buying weapons from the West. And how will the West survive if if we idiots don't buy weapons. Really? Well, Kashmir is one of the places that features prominently in your uh, in, in the Ministry of Utmost Happiness. It's one of the settings of the book. Now, y you've pointed out, as people have said, this book is suffused with politics, with the implication being that somehow fiction stands apart uh, from politics or partisanship. Uh, you said in a recent interview that the elite are partisan and so privileged that they don't uh, need to appear uh, to be. So could you explain that? And also, uh, the reception of your book in India 
in those terms? Well, look, uh, you know, I've always find, found it remarkable. I mean, The God of Small Things was a political book. After it won the Booker Prize, people in, uh, in India especially, but a lot of people, particularly in Kerala, w you know, liked to think about it because they wanted to claim me, but not the politics of the book. So let's ignore the fact that it's about the most brutal and ancient social hierarchy that any human society has produced, which is caste. Let's not talk about that. It can be a book about children, or it can be a book very lyrically written, and so on. But for me, the fact is that for fiction writers to avoid writing about caste, to avoid writing about Kashmir, you have to assume some extremely complicated yoga posture, you know. <laughs> the real thing is, can you look at the air, can you breathe? This is the air we breathe there. It's not just horror. It's music, it's poetry, it's Kashmir, it's caste, it's all of that, you know. So I don't, uh, I, I, I am not in the least bit uh, shy of saying that, that to me, it's, it's, as a writer, to be able to write about love, to be able to write about intimacy, about music, about poetry and violence with the same uh, intensity is what matters to me. But to try and edit out these things because you don't think that maybe the market wants it, I don't care about that. Well, Arundhati, tell us the plot of the book. It, it begins and ends in a cemetery. Um, uh, Hindus are not buried in cemeteries. They're cremated, so they're Muslim. And it's about, really, not the fringe minority, but the fringe majority, uh, in a sense. But tell us about the characters, how unusual this book is. Well, look, I mean, that's a rather mean question. Tell me the plot of the book. <laughs> it's difficult to say, to answer that. To me, um, what, what, what can I say? I, I, I think of it as a, as a city. You know, the, the plot is a city, like a big city of my part of the world. It has an old walled section. It has people trying to plan it and then those, citizens unplanning it, it's always sabotaging itself, the plot, and yet it does inscribe itself on the surface of the earth uh, against the contours of nature as cities do and as stories do, you know. But uh, I, I really wanted to write about the air. You know, I did not, I do not see this book as a book about issues, about political issues. Uh, one of the main characters, for example, it's not about marginalized people, as you say, at all. You know, it's got characters who, who are all, in some ways, India, India is a society that lives in a very fine grid. Only the West thinks of us as anarchic but we actually live in a very iron grid, a mesh, in which everyone lives within their caste, within their community, within their ethnicity. It's less than, a, uh, you know, like, I don't know, 3% or something of people who will marry outside their community. So the characters in this book somehow all have a, a border running through them, a pretty incendiary border running through them, whether it's of gender or caste or religious conversion and this uh, and the book uh, see it it sort of begins in the old city of delhi and then it just spirals out you know into the new metropolis into uh, i mean the into kashmir as you said but the nerve center of the book is this place called Jantar Mantar, which has been shut down now, but it used to be the place where protesters from all over India would gather. And it's a place where I spent a lot of time. And one night, I would spend nights there. I mean, it's just, it was just in a most interesting place, you know. And I would, uh, uh, one night when I was there, uh, a, a baby appeared on the pavement, abandoned. And all these movements, Bhopal, Kashmir, Narmada, all the wisdom, all the politics of all of us didn't know what to do with that abandoned baby. And it uh, made me think, you know, and so it, 
though, although that's not how the book begins, that is the nerve center, the, the, the scene in Jantar Mantar, the chapter called The Nativity, where this baby who's the antithesis of Christ is born, a little black girl swaddled in garbage. And uh, the story, in fact, that for me, that chapter, it's like the inversion of the ball at the beginning of War and Peace, you know, where all the beautiful people gather. This is the gutter ball, you know, and from there, uh, the story takes you out. And the main other characters outside of the baby, your main character. So, so the, f uh, the characters are, there is Anjum, she's um, born as Aftab. Uh, into a Shia Muslim family in Old Delhi, born as a boy, but uh, soon discovers that she is really a woman trapped in a man's body and, at the age of 16, leaves home to live in a community of hijras, the Urdu word for trans people. She lives in the Khwabga, which is the House of Dreams in Old Delhi, with a group of people who belong to a variety of genders, as complicated as the dunya, which is how they refer to the outside world. Dunya, again, in Urdu means the world. So there's themselves and the world as separate. And Anjum grows up, I mean, spends her teenage years and until she's about 40 there. Uh, one of the most uh, beautiful and most celebrated hijras of, uh, of Delhi, you know, the slow news story, the, the, all the foreign correspondents, everybody courts her, wants, you know, to do this story. And then she actually, uh, and then, you know, but the thing about her is she's not, that's not only who she is. She's not only a hijra. She's a Shia. She's a woman who wants to be a mother. She adopts a little girl. And then she gets caught up in the massacre of 2002 in Gujarat. And of course, caught up not because she's a hijra, but because she's a Muslim. And in fact, she escapes because she's a hijra, and people think it's bad luck to kill a hijra. And this really took place in 2002, the massacre? Yeah. The massacre, of course, it took place under the when Modi was the chief minister. And then Anjum comes back, is unable to continue life as she knew it, and she moves into a nearby graveyard where her relatives are. and. Slowly, as she recovers from her trauma, she begins to build a guest house there. Then there's her friend Saddam Hussein, who's a young Dalit, who, who also uh, escapes from a massacre of Dalits, again by the Hindu right, and he, in, a, in, in anger, decides to, to, to do what, Ambed, what Ambedkar, the great leader of the untouchables, did. He said, you must renounce Hinduism. So he renounces Hinduism and becomes a Muslim and calls himself Saddam Hussein. And he's her partner in running the guest house. And then you have one of the characters called Garson Hobart, who's a very upper caste, Brahmanical intelligence officer, who is, in a way, Part of him is the voice of the state, you know, who understands things in a historical perspective, who has the ability to wait, to watch, to, to, to uh, think in this generous... He's, he's a member of, let's say, the Nehruvian elite, who has been displaced now by this new Hindu right wing. But uh, Hobart, because that's the name of a character he plays in a college play, Garson Hobart is a pretty brilliant person, you know, and someone that all of us do have to contend with. He's not easy meat by any means. And then you have Musa and his friend Tilotama. Both Musa is a Kashmiri, Tilotama, his love, who are both. Uh, Tilotama is a is a is a strange woman living on the border of sanity and insanity. You know, a very very. Uh, individual and irreverent and lonely woman. Lonely in the sense that she's a loved woman, but she doesn't know how to really receive it because she lives on the borders of so many things. Arundhati Roy is describing her latest novel, her second. It's called The Ministry of Utmost Happiness, and we're going to continue with her in a moment. नहीं इस शहर में 
इस शहर में ओ कोई प्यार नहीं इस शहर Ain't No Love in the Heart of the City, that uh, version by Indian-American musician Zishan B, performing right here in our Democracy Now! studio to see the performances and the interview. Go to democracynow.org. Yes, this is Democracy Now!, the War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Nermeen Sheikh. Our guest is Arundhati Roy, the author of the new novel, well, now out in paperback, The Ministry of Utmost Happiness. Arundhati won the Booker Prize in 1997 uh, for her first book, The God of Small Things. So, Arundhati Roy, we, we concluded our, our first part of the discussion by talking about the book, The, the Ministry of Utmost Happiness. So, and the book more or less concludes um, with uh, uh, Modi, an allusion to, to, to Modi. You'd said earlier that he's, although formally associated with the uh, Bharatiya Janata Party, I mean, that's how he was elected, his uh, real ties are with the RSS. So, could you explain what the RSS stands for and why it's so significant that he's more closely aligned with the RSS than with the BJP? So, the RSS today, RSS stands for the Rashtriya Swayam Sevak Sangh, which is basically a sort of national self-help society. But it is the most powerful organization in the country today. It has, it was founded, as I said, in the 1920s. And uh, it has always believed in rewriting the Constitution. It has openly believed that India should be declared a Hindu nation. Its ideologues have openly <coughs> called Muslims of India, have said, you know, the Muslims of India like the Jews of Germany. Now, uh, it has, it has, it, it is a formidable organization. You know, it has, it works in education, it has women's wings, slum wings, forest dweller wings, publishing wings. It, it, it really writes the story of what is going on today. And it's not just Modi, but almost all his minister, ministers, including the former Prime Minister Vajpayee, Adwani, all of these people were members of the RSS. So whether or not the BJP loses elections or wins elections, the RSS's work is inexorable, you know. It just goes on. And so the BJP is just really the political arm of the RSS. There isn't any way that the BJP can have an independent agenda. It is fused with the RSS. So the danger today is that because of the massive majority with which they came to power, every institution has now been penetrated by the RSS. We're going to do part two of this discussion at democracynow.org. Arundhati Roy, author of the new novel, The Ministry of Utmost Happiness. And that does it for our broadcast. Oh, and yet another Democracy Now! family announcement. Jahan Guzder Turner, welcome to the world. Congratulations to our dear producer, Dina Guzder, and her husband, Peter. What a privilege it was for Nermeen and I to get to hang out with our very dear newest member of the Democracy Democracy Now! family, Jahan. And Jahan, which means world or universe. Welcome to the world. And the universe. I'm Amy Goodman <laughs> with Nermin Sheikh. <laughs> Sorry.